What a pleasure. Indeed, an honor to be here this evening. It's uh, so wonderful to be gathered with a group predominantly made up of young people who are looking for a focused career, a life's work, uh, and I suspect in the conversations I've had in elevators and in lobbies today, every one of you fancies yourself a change agent, so welcome to the nonprofit world. Before I begin, though, I'd like to make a couple of acknowledgments. Um, I don't know how many of you know, how many of you, this is your first conference, your first institute? I can't see the hands, but I'm assuming there's a lot of them out there. I'm going to acknowledge a, a young lady who has done many, many of these as a staff leader and who after 17 years of faithful service to this organization will retire this year, Phyllis Wallace. Phyllis, would you stand and be recognized for your leadership over all these years? God bless you. There she is, okay. She was over there last time I looked. And then another recognition that I would make, and I'd be remiss if I didn't do this, from our own organization, the Boy Scouts of America. Mr. Jim Terry, who after 42 years, uh, retired January 1st of this year, but he's also the chairman of the board of the Nonprofit Alliance, formerly American Humanics, and will continue to serve in that role until June. And as I said at a retirement event a few weeks ago in Dallas, when I'm all done and I'm finished with my journey, I hope at least one person said he was almost as good as Jim Terry. Jim has given a life of service and dedication to this great movement, to the youth of America, and to the nonprofit world. Jim, would you stand and take a bow? <laughs> and how apropos it is, and it's just an accident that it happened this way, but how apropos it is that we're here at a conference, a convention of young people looking to the future, and we take just a moment to celebrate a couple of folks who've had an incredible run at service in this wonderful sector called the nonprofit sector. And I think the, the juxtaposition of those stars makes a perfect setting for our conversation this evening. Uh, first of all, the Boy Scouts of America and its partnership with which is now the Nonprofit Alliance but most of us are going to have a very difficult time, at least for a couple of years, my quit stopping saying American Humanics, are really excited and proud of this partnership. We were one of the forming partners of this organization right here in Kansas City with Roe Bartle. It's been a mutually beneficial partnership for decades, and we're delighted and honored that we're still partnering and looking forward to a great future with this organization. You see, because in my humble opinion, the work of the Alliance, the work that you're contemplating in our society, the American society, indeed the world society, has never been more important than it is today. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but it's because of that realization that I have very firmly embedded in my heart and soul that I'm proud to continue our strong partnership with the Alliance. Almost 43 years ago, it'll be 43 years in July, I can't believe it, time flies when you're having fun, I began this wonderful journey. You know, uh, I started in Modesto, California in 1971 in July. Anybody ever been to Modesto, California? There you go. Everybody, anybody ever been there in July? It's hot. And I moved there from Morro Bay, over on the coast, on July 1st. And I thought, my gosh, what have I gotten into here? You know, I started with the same motivations that I suspect that you have. I'm a product of a program. I'm sure many of you are products of a program. In my case, the program happened to be scouting. I'm an Eagle Scout. Um, I'm one of eight children, son of an Italian immigrant who spent his entire life looking for that little niche in the American dream where he can create an opportunity for his kids that was greater than his own, and my mom, of course, her own. One of eight kids, the greatest day of my young life, my young life, of course, was the day that my mom pinned my eagle badge on my chest, how proud I was, and my dad standing there beaming. The second greatest day of my young life was the day that my oldest brother left home when I was a sophomore in high school and I slept in a bed alone for the first time. 
So I knew what it was like every day to get up and have it be a little bit better than the day before. And so when I graduated from college at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and I got this job with the Boy Scouts, actually uh, it was a camp director, a man who I admired, who had talked to me several summers ago on the camp staff about what are you going to do when you grow up, kid? And here's a man I worshipped and admired saying to me that he thought I had what it takes to do what he did, and I was very proud and honored for that and stuck in my mind. And sure enough, here we go, July 1st, 1971. I'm going to go to work for the Boy Scouts for $8,000 a year. All the money in the world. I'd never seen that kind of money before. I had my one suit, the only suit I owned, but it was pressed and clean. A brand new tie and a brand new shirt show up on July 1st at the council office, and there on my desk is my name on a plate already engraved. Business cards already with my name on them. I'm an executive. I've arrived. Out in the parking lot, that was back in the day of the lease card days. Remember that, Jim? The Mercury Montegos. And there was a brand new Mercury Montego Landau top, leather seats, lease car, company car. I had no idea a new car had any kind of a smell, let alone a good one. I'd never been in one before. But I go outside and I get in my car and I get my keys and I said, wow, the adventure begins. And an adventure it's been because the very next day I was introduced to a, a man named John Hausman, who was a volunteer. His day job was he was a director of printing for the county of Stanislaus, had a staff of about 50. But his weekend job, his evening job, and his passion was he was a district membership chairman for the Chief Tenaya District in Stanislaus County. And that was the day I became aware for the first time of the magic relationship between volunteers and professionals in the nonprofit sector. So I started out with this passion that I sense many of you have. I'm a product of a program. I had a passion to do meaningful work. I was going to be a change agent. And it's kind of like your conference theme here this week, be inspired. Be connected. Be the change. And I set out with every one of those aspirations in 1971. And it's had its ups and it's had its downs. It's been a remarkable and a varied adventure. And I'd be lying if I told you every day was a great day. Because not every day is a great day. But because of the connection to the mission and the passion that I've had for 43 years to the work of the movement of the Boy Scouts of America, I've been able to connect with that and get through the rough spots, and so it's been great. I've lived all over the country. Uh, Ken gave an abbreviated version of my introduction. I'm so glad he does, because every time that long one is read, I know these folks are sitting out thinking, this guy can't keep a job, because <laughs> I just have bounced all over, but it's been a great adventure. I've had great mentors over my career, great champions, people who took stock in me and took an interest in me and spent time and energy to help me. There are two men that I've worked for in my life and my career that I would die for. Both of them picked me up at a time when I needed to be picked up, expressed confidence in me and showed me the way back to victory and um, I owe them a lot. And wrapped up in all of that are these incredible volunteers. I mentioned John Hausman. But I could go on and on and on and on, a litany of volunteers. We'll mention them again in just a moment, not individually, but volunteers. But it's just remarkable. You know, Mike Fletch was the council president in Stockton, California, in the 49er Council, when I became the scout executive, my first CEO's opportunity. Mike and I were so close, he and his wife Patty and their two kids, Chris and Sarah, and Nanette and I, and Nanette, my wife, and our two kids, Joe and Vince, we raised our kids together, we traveled together, we toiled in the vineyards together. I haven't seen him in about three years, but I know I could walk into a cocktail party in Stockton, or a, a root beer float party in Stock, Stockton, California today, and I'd see him in the corner, I'd walk across, I'd stick out my hand, I said, how you doing, Mike? As I was saying... It's just that kind of a relationship. And my fondest hope for those of you who do go into the world of the nonprofit sector is that you find quickly volunteers like that who, based on mutual respect and trust, each understanding their role in the equation, develop these kind of friendships that last a lifetime. 
Why did I say a little bit earlier that I believe that the work of the Nonprofit Alliance, the work that you are contemplating, has never been more important than it is today? I'm not gonna, I don't want to be a downer because I'm a, my glass is always half full. I've been accused of being Pollyanna all my life, but I'm going to share a couple of things with you that concern me terribly as us as a people. And I do believe we're on a real slippery slope. Look around you at the dearth in leadership, the dearth of leadership with integrity in the world today. Think about it. Integrity is an endangered species in many cases. Politics are so nasty and dirty, it's win at any cost. And especially those of you who are thinking about youth service organizations growing up strong, healthy children, we desperately and have never more desperately needed you than we do today. The educational malaise that we have today across this land, test scores are plummeting. The dropout rate, especially in urban America, is atrocious. We should be embarrassed as a people that in many, many school districts, 50% dropout rate is not unusual. As a matter of fact, it's common. The whole notion of science, technology, engineering, and math, we're losing the race. And it's a race for our position in the global marketplace, which allows us to maintain our position in the moral marketplace. We're on a real slippery slope. We have anger issues as a people. We were talking about this at our table tonight at dinner. You know, I'm convinced that technology is a wonderful thing. I wouldn't give up my iPhone for all the tea in China. I love it. I love the apps, especially Angry Birds. I wouldn't give it up for all the tea in China. I found a new casino game yesterday that makes me a real winner at craps. I love it. But let me tell you what I'm fearful of as it relates to technology today and the whole notion of an angry people. There was a time not too long ago when if I was mad at somebody or thought they had done me wrong, I would write them a letter. I would go to my desk, I'd find a pencil and a piece of paper, and I would write a letter. Probably misspell a couple of words, so I'd have to write it one more time. And then I'd find an envelope, and I'd have to address the envelope. Then I'd have to find a stamp and lick the stamp and put it on the envelope, and then lick the envelope and close it shut, and then walk up to the street and put it in the mailbox and put the flag up. And unless it was a weekend, it might go tomorrow. What do we do today? Just hit send. And you can't unsend it. But in the days that we talk about, which might have been in some ways the good old days, you had an awful lot of time to think about, is that really the way that I want to deal with that person? Is that really the way I want to express my disappointment? And so we have angry issues as a people. And probably more critically than anything else that faces us today is the health of children in America. You know, when Richard Carmona, by the way, what a great man, was our Surgeon General, there's a great American success story, rags to riches, the American dream coming to life in a young man from the barrio. When he was our Surgeon General several years ago, he testified before a committee of Congress about the health of children in America. And I was invited by a peer and a colleague and a friend, Al Lambert, to read that testimony. And I did, and there was a lot of stuff in that that was way above my pay grade. He was a doctor, and he said some stuff I certainly didn't understand. But he said one thing that I understood that scared me to death. When Dr. Carmona looked at this committee of Congress and said, ladies and gentlemen, in my humble opinion, we're on the verge of the first generation in our history that's likely to be less healthy and live fewer years than their parents. Because of the sedentary lifestyle of children today, because of the untold hours, it's up to like 11 and a half now, the average, connected to some kind of an electronic pal, because of the onset, childhood obesity and the onset of adult diseases in children today, we're on the verge of having the first generation in the history of mankind that's likely to be less healthy and live fewer years than their parents. Think about that. Think about that as a people. It has nothing to do with the Boy Scouts, and yet it has everything to do with the Boy Scouts and the whole nonprofit sector and the for-profit and government. But think about it. If Dr. Carmona's prophecy is true, who's going to cover, who's going to pay the, just the health costs? We can't figure out how to pay health bills today. If what he says is true, who's going to pay the tab? 
For those of us looking to be employed in the, in the American workplace and for those employers out there looking for a healthy workforce that's going to come today, every day, come to work, give you a good day's work for a day's pay with a good old American work ethic and help keep your products and services and goods competitive in the global marketplace, where are you going to find that workforce if what Dr. Carmona says is true? Now, I travel a lot. 232 nights in a hotel in 2010, over 200 this last year. It's all self-inflicted. A lot of it's bad. You've got to take your shoes off, go through security and all that. But one of the pleasures of travel for me as I travel through America's great airports, whether it's Kansas City or New York or Dallas or San Francisco, it doesn't matter, walking through a terminal and seeing these wonderful young American men and women in their BDUs, either coming back from or on their way to deployment in far-flung places in this great world to defend those freedoms that we take so for granted. And I cherish those young people, their commitment, their passion, and their capacity because they're healthy young people to take on this challenge that they freely take. If Dr. Carmona's prophecy is true, where are we going to find those people? So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the noble work of raising healthy, strong, physically, mentally, and emotionally children is noble work, it's God's work, and it's critical work in our country today. We're on a really, really slippery slope. And we can do it. It's so fun to get engaged with a project like the summit and put their hair on fire at 10, 2, and 4 every day and see what happens, the transformation. It's so remarkably fun to be at a Y and to watch a child swim for the first time, accomplish something they've never done before. Not only did they learn to swim, which might save their life, they learned a little bit about themselves, and they achieved some self-confidence, and from that they take another step, and they become a leader of some kind, leading a peer group down the right path. That's the work of the nonprofit world. And all too often, we're ready as a people to turn to government and say, fix it. Government can't afford to fix it, and they don't know how to fix it. The resources we have available, the leveraging effect of a nonprofit organization with a small staff and a bazillion volunteers, you can't beat it. In the Boy Scouts of America, we have about 6,000 professional employees nationwide and 1.1 million volunteers. There's nothing we can't do if we put our mind to it. So you're on the verge of, I hope, a life-changing decision about not only your life, but the lives of individuals and communities all across America. And it all happens in communities. By the way, when I first went to Modesto, that was a local council, six staff, I had no idea there was anything like a national organization. It took me five years before I knew there was a national council. It's all local. Lives are changed in church basements and Ys and boys and girls clubs in neighborhoods across America. They're not changed at the national headquarters of the Boy Scouts of America in Dallas, Texas. So it's all local. So all that being said, and I know that you have the right inspiration and the right motivation and you're saying, okay, let's go do it, that might not just be enough. You see, I think there are some things that, if we're going to do it right, we need to think about as we begin to look to a career or any kind of life's work or any kind of hobby. You know, if you're going to get good at something, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? Practice and prepare, right? Now, for me, it works for everything but golf. I mean, I, no matter how hard I try, I can't get any better. But mostly, if you practice and you prepare, you're going to be a lot better off than if you just want to do something, aren't you? If I, I really want to do good. I want to be a change agent. But in the real world, what does that mean? Well, I believe there are certain things that uh, you have to have, some inherent skill sets, work habits, sort of ethical things that are important if you're going to contemplate launching a career, especially in the non-for-profit world. And number one on that list is a personal code of conduct. You know, for me, it's the scout oath in law. It's as simple as that. It's been my 
guiding star since I was a little boy. So things like, on my honor, I'll do my best and do my duty to God and my country and trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent, those aren't all just words anymore. They were the first day I showed up and they made me memorize them, made me mad. But over the course of time, in a programmatic, very intentional way, you get side by side with these concepts and you breathe life into these concepts and all of a sudden you begin to know what it feels like to help other people. It feels pretty good. You know what it feels like to be trusted, to be trustworthy and to sample leadership for the first time. But it starts with a personal code of conduct and especially in the nonprofit world. Like it or not, and if you don't, go find something else to do. Like it or not, we're held to a higher standard. Rightfully so. We're held to a higher standard. And each of us engaged in the enterprise of our organization in the not-for-profit world not only owns and operates our own reputation, but that of our entire organization. You know, there was a time when a speed bump, somebody messed up or did something bad in a bubblegum, Iowa. Is there a town called Bubblegum, Iowa? I use that all the time, and I don't think so, but I love the name. But if there were, somebody messes up in a not-for-profit, cheats on something or does something bad, it only affected that little town. Well, not today. Anybody with a cell phone with a camera on and a grudge can ruin your day. We live in a different kind of world. So a personal code of conduct that you take with you 24-7 is really important. Second, I would suggest that if you don't learn how to honor, respect, and engage your volunteers in a meaningful, absolutely heartfelt way, we can't possibly be as successful as we would like to be. Volunteers are the backbone, the heartbeat, the dreams and possibilities and potential of any not-for-profit. And the sooner you learn their value and their worth and celebrate that value and worth, the more effective you're going to be. Now. One other little axiom, you may not know this, but not-for-profit doesn't mean you have to be broke. <laughs> not-for-profit simply means that you don't return dividends to shareholders. And so if you truly want to be a successful not-for-profit leader and executive, you need to hone some business skills and some business acumen. You know, our mission is what motivates us, but the business of our business is what sustains us. And for many, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'll be terribly honest with you, for many over the course of my career, young people who came out with all of the best intentions and motivations to be a change agent and work for good in the nonprofit sector, the first and foremost thing that disillusions them the quickest is the business of our business. And yet without the business of our business, we couldn't do our mission. And so it's important that you understand that things like fundraising, good business practices and all of that are as important as our ability to define, articulate, and execute on our mission. But just remember, not-for-profit doesn't mean you have to be broke. And then I guess I would advise you to learn about and then understand and then become a practitioner of good governance. Governance, good governance in all things that we do. You know, the Sarbanes-Oxley thing that's happened to the for-profit world in terms of scrutiny on, on business practices is just a harbinger of things to come for us in the not-for-profit world. I would say, let's out Sarbanes-Oxley them and all be good stewards of the resources before it's mandated and we're told to. Understand what governance is and exercise and practice good governance. You see, our donors, our clients, our constituents, everybody in our universe, whatever universe that happens to be, deserves nothing less than good governance. When you think about the widow's mite and that, that individual who gave you that $100 donation when they probably shouldn't have because they couldn't afford it, they have every right to expect that you're going to get $120 worth of service out of that. And that comes with good governance. And the sooner you learn all the nuances of that, the better and more effective that you're going to be. And then finally, if you want to be a change agent, be willing to risk, be willing to take the steps necessary to be innovative and to change. But don't be so risky and so innovative that you forget 
your mission and who you are. Over the course of my 40 years, and if you look over the 100 years of the Boy Scouts of America, or the YMCA, or the Boys and Girls Clubs, the roadside is littered with the bones of organizations and agencies that started out with the best of intentions and then lost their way, trying to chase either the current conventional wisdom or morph into something else just to chase the dollars and all of a sudden they don't remember their mission. So innovation and creativity are important as long as you stay grounded in your mission. The Boy Scouts have been going through a, uh, ask Jim, he, he cherishes the thought that I've only got a few more months left because I can't start any more changes after I'm gone. But the last five years, we've gone through a complete reinvention, morphing into, you know, it was a point in our time, in our history where a pride point for us was it took eight years, by golly, and we were proud of it to get a new merit badge approved. When I first started in Dallas as a director, not as the chief, but as a director, to get a, a, a communication out to more than 50 people required 13 approvals on a sheet of paper. 13 approvals on a sheet. That's bureaucracy at work. So change and innovation is good if you can clear away that kind of clutter, but never lose sight of your mission. And then at the end of the day, you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, I couldn't spell blog six years ago. Now I write one. I, I thought blog was a disease. I had no idea what a blog was. <laughs> So embracing and understanding technology is important, but not at the expense of the human element, human relations, and human contact, which is what all not-for-profits have thrived on from the very beginning. So let me wrap it up by just saying that I believe for you um, there is a great and rewarding career just waiting out there if you're willing to take the plunge. If you're willing to be honest and open with what you really want and how hard you're really willing to go get what you want. And you're willing to settle for some psychic income in addition to a pretty good living. I can't complain. I, I, I've never, I don't have holes in my shoes. <laughs> I'm OK. Uh, pretty good living. But you learn to really enjoy and appreciate the psychic income as well. Embrace every day from the perspective that you're doing good and noble work that makes a difference in your community. The world needs you. The world needs each and every one of you. If you have it in your heart to make a commitment to truly make a difference in the lives of humanity, there is no better place to exercise that commitment than in the nonprofit universe. Public and private partnerships with nonprofits are critically important to solving the problems we have in the world today. But I'll guarantee you, none of them can get done without the nonprofit universe. And I guess I would be remiss in my duties to my company if I didn't say to each and every one of you, the Boy Scouts want you. And Carolyn is here. Stop and see Carolyn. We're looking for good, a few good people, men and women. So, ladies and gentlemen, Godspeed in your chosen endeavors. And thank you for allowing me to uh, break bread with you tonight, to come to Kansas City to see the the future, and I feel better having been here. Thank you so much.